Please join me in welcoming DeWitt Jones. Good so, morning. Good morning. Well, my family and I watched you at the SIOR conference. It, it, it must have been about 15 years ago in Tucson, Arizona. Um, we were so engaged and mesmerized by your presentation. Uh, it's, it's one thing to motivate someone on the spot, but it's something else to have them remember it for years beyond. And I just want to say thank you. You're more than welcome. So our last speaker, Ron, uh, Robert Thornburg, was all about positivity. Your philosophy is also extraordinarily optimistic. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a photographer? Sure. Uh, I went to college, no idea what I wanted to do, no burning passion. Uh, majored in drama because it seemed like it would be fun. Um, got to be a senior, figured, oh my God, I got to figure this out. And uh, applied and was accepted into Harvard Business School. And my father was ecstatic. And I thought, well, okay, that's it. That's what, that's what young men do. We can go into business, everything will be fine. He thought so too. And then spring term of my senior year, three of us got together one night and we just began to dream, just to, to vision what we would do after graduation. We could do anything we wanted. And uh, we came up with this crazy idea of kayaking 1,100 miles up the coast of Japan on sort of a people-to-people -people expedition. And I said, I'll make a movie of it. I'd never made a movie before in my life. But I got up the next morning with my first real vision and the, the energy, the passion that came from that. And so I withdrew my acceptance to Harvard and applied out to UCLA Film School to learn how to make movies. Hmm. And then called my dad. And there was a deafening silence on the other end of the line. <laughs> but they supported me. They helped me go to, to UCLA. And uh, I learned filmmaking and we talked the geographic into doing the show and that turned my life in a totally different direction. <clears throat> so each picture you've taken tells a timeless story. You've created memorable characters, captured the essence of nature and human culture with originality and emotion. But some of the best photos tells us as much about the photographer as the photo itself. Which photos describe you best? I think the two photos that uh, they're, they're two of my most iconic photos, but they're two of the ones that mean the most to me. One of them is the picture of my daughter in the hammock, uh, which, you, which you've seen if you've seen my show. Uh, the purity, the love of that, the caring that I have for, you know, it's expressed toward my daughter, but it could have been expressed toward my wife or my son. Um, that kind of connection and that kind of love for humanity is something that I express in my pictures a lot uh, because I celebrate what's right with the world. I, I'm not a war photographer. That's not where I would be drawn. I don't deny that that's there, but I'm drawn to the best in humankind. So that picture of my daughter in the hammock and then the picture of the puffball, of the dandelion in the field, where it turns into this orb of rainbows and possibilities. And for me to be in that field thinking that there was absolutely nothing there to shoot. And within th a foot of where I was standing, finding just by changing my perspective, this incredible vision that's always served as sort of a, a you know, a symbol of, of what my life is about. Both of those pictures are extraordinary. Um, you know, before you photograph, what are some of your preparations? Well, there's two, two kinds of preparations. There's, you know, knowing your technique inside and out. You do not want to be stumbling over your camera, your equipment, what's your f-stop, what's your shutter speed, and any more than, you know, LeBron James is thinking about the ball when he's tearing down the court, you know, it's just part of him then. And that's how I want, my, and I don't care what you're doing. you can be selling real estate, you can be playing basketball, you can be taking pictures. You want your technique at the highest level that you can bring it to. 
so that it just becomes an extension of, of what you want to have happen. So that's, I work on that all the time. That's first in a sense. But then when I show up at wherever it is, and this may seem strange, but I want to show up in neutral. I want to show up most, especially in photojournalism, without a pre-existing idea of what my picture is going to be. Advertising, it's different. Then you're making a photograph. Some guy made a sketch, he gave it to you, you go make it happen. But in photojournalism, you walk into somewhere and you're going to tell a story and you don't know what the story is. So you, sh you don't want to prejudge that story. You want to say to yourself, What's wanting to happen in this situation? What's, what's the story and how can I, can I get clear enough to see it? So, uh, you know, and in nature, you may set out to shoot waterfalls, but if nature's doing trees that day in terms of light and weather, you shoot trees, you know? So it's a question of being open and flexible with with a a broader vision of what you want to have happen. So whether you're using an expensive camera or an iPhone, uh, what's more important, the finished product or the experience itself? That's a great question. Uh, what I would like to have is both. If if I'm if I'm working, you know, if I'm being hired by somebody then the finished product, that's what they want. That's what they hired me for. If I'm shooting by myself, uh, I want the experience of the connection. I don't want to be so locked up in my photography that I, I miss the extraordinary person I'm stranding in front of or the sunset or the waves or whatever. What I want to do is have both. You know, I'd like to have both. I'd like to come back to the client and say, what do you think of these? And they, I blow their mind. And I'd like to say, oh my God, that day on the beach was incredible toward exposing, exposing my soul, toward making me a better human being. So I'm thinking both all the time. Uh, photography is a way for me to get closer to the world. And uh, I don't want it to get in the way of the world. There are some times when you, I would come back from an assignment and everything would be in a little two by three box. You know, it, it, was, it was me and then there was the camera and then there was reality. And I just had to put them down for a while and connect back into the world. If I'm really at the top of my game, I can do both. So you were quoted as saying, it's not trespassing to go beyond our own boundaries. How would you encourage someone to go beyond their boundaries? That gets back to, to whether or not you believe you're a creative person. Creativity to me is looking at things at the world differently. Innovation is doing things differently. So if you, it's real hard to do things differently unless you see things differently. Uh, if you believe that there's more than one right answer, if you start to look at the world that way, so something dead ends for you and you just go, well, I'll just keep looking. There's a better answer for it, even if it's great. You've built a company, it's great, and you're always asking yourself, what's the next right answer? Where do we go from here? And you do that not in terror, not like, God, if I look for it, the whole thing's going to collapse. No, that's the way the world works. That's the way creativity works. So then innovation is not a, oh, God, we're going to innovate, and he's going to change things, and I'm not going to like it. It's just, of course, we're going to innovate. And we feel ready to do that, says the individual person. So, you know, when film changed to digital, right, there were photographers who just went, nuts. They couldn't make the jump. They couldn't go beyond their own boundaries. And if you said, why? It's the same camera. Everything is the same except you get a digital image rather than a still image. And you just, you just see that, you know, you just, I'm not doing it. I'm not changing. Well, uh, you're not going to be very flexible. You're not going to find the next right answer. You're not going to be successful. So 
it's not trespassing to go beyond your own boundaries. It's, say, it's me sort of saying, going beyond your own boundaries is what life is about, gang. When you, when you castle up, you're in trouble. So I have a book. Uh, it's called The Hidden Life of Trees. I don't know if you've read it, but it talks about the mysterious connections of trees, its energy, and the uh, incredible amount of life that surrounds us. And my wife makes fun of me every time she sees me reading this uh, because it's about trees. Uh, and, you know, and you say that by celebrating what's right, we find the energy to fix what is wrong. What do you mean by that? We all have a vision of how we hit the world and what we think the world is. And you, that can be a positive vision or a negative vision. Um, if you just watch the evening news or worse, cable 24 hours a day, you're gonna get a very negative vision of the world. Why? That's how they sell advertising. That's what they put on but it's not what's happening in the world. It's just a part of it. If that's all you watch, it sucks energy out of you. It takes energy from you. You get more and more either depressed or angry or both. And it gives you maybe a certain kind of energy called adrenaline that comes from fear, but it's not, it's not energy that you can sustain. When you have a positive vision of the world, when you actually, as a practice, go out and try and celebrate what's right with the world, your world, every day, that leads toward love. That leads toward abundance. That leads towards more than one right answer. That gives you passion. And that energy is much greater, much better to work with than fear. So. I want a positive vision of the world. And, you know, in my, in my show, I don't offer you solutions. I offer you a practice. It's not something you do once. You walk around your house and say, yep, really great place. I'm so glad I live here. That's celebrating what's right with the world. Now I can go turn on the news and find out what's wrong. No, it's a, it's a conscious decision to live that way every day so that it changes the way I look at the world. And through your lens, you've showed that, uh, that, there is, right. that there is far more right with the world than there is wrong with it. Now, when did you find that spark for photography that encouraged you to embrace the puffballs in life? It wasn't so much photography. It was that I got a job at National Geographic, and that's what they did, right? At that point, I, was, I knew how to photograph, and I knew how to make movies because I'd spent two years getting my master's in it. But I really wasn't, I wasn't one of these guys who photographed from the time they were a kid, right? This was just the coolest job in the world, right? They'd send me out and they'd say, tell a story. And I, I liked that. And, but they sent me out. It wasn't the National Enquirer. It was the National Geographic. And it was amazing. You know, I, in fact, I, I, I felt that if people were sad, they just ought to say, hi, I work for National Geographic to each other because everybody would trust me. They, you know, they'd ask me into their homes, they'd open up in the story of life, because the geographic, and they knew it, because they'd seen it, celebrated what was right with the world. They couldn't maybe articulate that. And it's not emblazoned anywhere at the geographic. But that's why we keep those silly yellow magazines. If, if, if I'd said, Hi, I work for National Enquirer, the door would have slammed shut. So that's what my that's what my job was to go out and in every situation to to tell the whole story to find the best of it to celebrate what was right with it that obviously influenced the way i looked at the world so you taught yourself to uh, you said train your technique uh, put yourself in the place of most potential leave yourself open to all possibilities and focus your vision by celebrating what's right with the situation why is it important to believe there is more than one right answer? If you believe there's more than one right answer, you either don't have it and you're going to look for it and there's only one of them. So that immediately means your blinders, 
you know, you're blinding yourself to any other possibility. And we all know in life that sometimes we're working toward a goal, hopefully not thinking that's the only right answer, but a goal, right? We'd like to do this. And something over here is going, hey, hello, hello. And you're not seeing it because you are so focused on this, right? If you believe there's more than one right answer, you can still go after a goal, but you're always saying, is there, is there another way that that's being solved around me? Is there another way of putting it together? It's, much, it's a much more flexible, open way of looking at the world. So you, And if you think you have the right answer, then you're going to fight to hold on to it and not change. And I'm sorry, but life and the world is all about change. It's not going to stay static. And, you know, you can't go backwards and say, uh, God, I wish it was the way it was 10 years ago. You're not the way you were 10 years ago. Good luck. Uh, so you were once quoted as saying, the more in focus uh, you are, the more you see a world full of great beauty, if you're open to see it, uh, you know, and it reminds me of uh, J.M. Barry's famous line, all children except one grow up to be a professional, you go to work you make a living, you go home, you eat, sleep, you do it again the next day. And, uh, and I believe that that, uh, that line is, uh, is fundamentally flawed, um, even though it's a children's book. Uh, you know, a child that, uh, uh, um, uh, that uh, a child has that innate intrigue uh, to explore new ideas, be creative, uh, innovate, and all while having fun. And you can still do that by harnessing that energy and focusing on your profession when you make it your passion. Now, like you said, you just have to be willing to see it in anything you do. Um, and photography is certainly your, is clearly your passion. What words of encouragement would you give to others to help find their passion? First of all, I'd like to redefine passion a little bit. Passion to me is when you fall in love with something. You know, that's how we use it. We say, oh my God, I fell in love and I feel such passion, usually for, you know, your partner. But I feel so much passion for bike riding or I feel so much passion for my business or, you know, energy. It comes up on you. You, you fall in love with it. You love what you do. And and the thing of it is, is that, that there are some people who knew from the time they were two that they were going to be a ballet dancer or a pianist. Most of us are not that way. We have passionettes. We have things that we fall in love with that suddenly open the world to us and they last for a while. Some of them last our whole life. Some of them last for a year. Some of them, you know, last for a moment. But they, they all do the same thing. They're that moment where we, where we saw the world in a different way. It became a passion. We were just overwhelmed by it. And so I would not spend your whole life looking for one passion that's going to take it over because most people may long for that, may think it's a cool idea, but that's not how their life unfolds. And I'd rather, I think of myself as somebody who has a whole bunch of passionettes. Some of them have stayed my whole life. Some of them have long disappeared. And some of them I've yet to discover. Uh, but all of them fill me with the same energy. So taking that, what are some of the most remarkable places that you journeyed through? That's a, that's a really interesting question because there's... When people say, oh, you work for the National Geographic, one of the first questions they say is, have you ever been shot at? And I go, have you read the magazine? Uh, <laughs> I, I, no, I've never been shot at, nor do I ever want to be shot at, right? Well, how far from here, wherever we are, have you been? As if by going further away, it will get cooler. No, it may get colder, or it may get hotter, but it doesn't necessarily get cooler. You know, it's just you. Have, and then sometimes you say, well, I had a great time in Morocco. And especially before COVID, people would say, well, hell, I've been to Morocco. You know, they want me to go to someplace that nobody's ever been before. And that's that's cool. 
But you can do that in just the way you see the world. Proust said, the real voyage of discovery is not in seeing new places, but in having new eyes, right? So when I would be sent to a place that I didn't know anything about, I'd try and find the man or the woman whose eyes were going around like this, like, like Mr. Toad in Wind in the Willows, who was so blown out by Des Moines or Alaska or wherever the heck they were, that they were going to show me why this was the coolest place on earth, right? And I'm sort of going, yeah, well, okay, you know, show me. And they would. Uh, so at the end of the time at the Geographic, I, I, I would go to, I, I wouldn't care where they sent me. I just, I, I mean, obviously I'm not a city guy, so I didn't really want to do a big city as an assignment, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't freak out about where they were going, where they were sending me, because I knew it was going to be, if I had my eyes open, it was going to be cool. Right, no matter where uh, you go. And, and that's the best way to travel anyway, because I knew that the best photographs I got were not the ones I saw in my head before I left. Hmm. What photos did you think had the least amount of potential that you were most impressed by? Sometimes, you know, you're, you're walking through a situation and you just, and things just come together. Uh, and you, you know, or you get to the pass and the mountains at the right time and the sun sets and you don't have to do anything. I mean, you could be a total neophyte. Nature's doing it all. You just click the button, right? But there are other times, and, and, and let me go back to the puffball. Finding a field of dandelions, which is certainly a place of potential. I could have gotten a shot there, but I wasn't in it. It just, I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the vision. And I walked away from what I thought was a place of potential, but light wasn't right. Maybe I'd come back tomorrow. Maybe I needed a cup of coffee. Who knows why? I left. So I never found out the potential of the field of dandelions. And when I got back, because I knew it was an interesting place to shoot, it was all puffballs. And it, from my wide angle lens, it was not pretty. It wasn't interesting. And it got less interesting. You know, I got down there and screwed around with it and played different ways. And it wasn't happening. But I'm going after, all right, come on. Where's the next right answer? How long can I keep, you know, how long can I keep playing with this? And then I found the one that has become one of the most iconic photographs I've ever taken. So I, I don't, and, and actually with the iPhone, since the iPhones came out, I will play with that little test. Uh, I'll be sitting in an airport you know, at uh, gate 14. And they say, I'm sorry, the plane has been delayed for 20 minutes. And I'll go, okay, without leaving my seat, can I take a cool picture? Right here in gate 24 in the Dulles airport. Right. Most people. And, and that's really fun, especially when you manage to find one. It just underlines the idea that there's more than one right answer, you know? Can you keep looking for those? So I will leave you with yet one more quote of yours that should resonate with people. Stop pushing to be the best in the world and allow yourself to be the best for the world. Mr. DeWitt, thank you for being a part of ours. You bet, sir.